Often we have a sermon, a message, a talk on a Sunday morning. And we're doing something slightly different. We're doing a message, but we're doing it sort of in a dialogical way. We're going to talk, um, ask a few questions. Uh, the, the big, uh, I guess, topic that we're exploring under the umbrella of, of loving our neighbor is the issue, the very sobering issue of domestic violence. Uh, Julie comes to us from Safe Haven Ministries, um, which serves Kent County in, in two big ways, um, which Julie will talk about as time goes on. But I, I wanted to take a moment here at the beginning to uh, set up some logistics. We are going to have a time for questions after this, uh, up to 10 minutes, depending on how time goes. Uh, so feel free to scratch down a question um, so that way you kind of have that there um, when, when the time comes. Um, also, we, we wanted to uh, make sure that we establish this concept of a ministry partnership. We're ministry partners with Safe Haven. We're doing our best as a community to sort of support, provide as much of encouragement and you know, financial, any number of different ways to support what Safe Haven is doing for uh, victims of domestic abuse. In the same way, Safe Haven is seeking to support us in empowering us, uh, sort of like illumining the path for us, helping us understand the issue of domestic violence. So that being said, uh, it, hopefully that makes a little bit more sense of uh, setting the context for this morning. Um, and we're going we're gonna to continue forward. Um, oh, I'll give you Julie's title as long as we're at it. She does outreach. Um, she's the Outreach Education and Prevention Program Manager. So she's the voice, sort of. Could you say that? Yeah, I of, guess so. Of awareness uh, uh, and, and for safe haven. Um, and we're going to begin our, uh, this is official now, you see. We're going to begin with sort of some biblical paradigms for why is it that we are seeking to, to love people and how, how does that take shape uh, in, in providing relief from domestic abuse? Um, one thing that I think about when I think about loving your neighbor is to love actually both the victim and the assailant, but I think you love them differently, but they are both our neighbor. I think both a victim of abuse and an assailant are spiritually captive um, to evil. I mean, the victim is sort of captive to the abuser trying to keep her down and keep her from leaving. And the abuser is really captive in a spiritual sense too. I mean, the devil is really all about power and control, right? He likes to trick us into sinning, and if he can get us to do it a few times, pretty soon we're not even deciding to sin. It just sort of happens, and then he's got us, and he reveals his, his true nature. And I really think that abuse is just a total distortion of what a love relationship, of what a marriage, a dating relationship is supposed to be, like um, Christ talks about, or the example of Christ in Ephesians 5, where um, women are asked to submit to their husbands, but husbands are asked to love their wives as Christ loved the church and died for her. So Christ actually was beaten and wounded and killed for us, which is the opposite, right, of an abuser trying to harm um, his partner and often eventually killing them. And so this really is a social justice issue to free victims and to free abusers. And as we continue thinking about that, we remember that uh, in Genesis 1, mm -hmm. um, 26 to 28, uh, the very opening of the Bible talks about how each of us is created <coughs> in God's image. We bear the stamp mm -hmm. of God. And so each of us deserves to have uh, a safe place, you know, certain, certain things. And as Christians, we, we are or at least we should be, on the forefront of making that possible for all people. So that said, that said I just got a lovely text from Chris from PC. How encouraging. <laughs> so that said, we have, we have so much reason to be here. And we, we see through the lens of this image of God theology that 
Each of us has something unique about us from God. So bearing that in mind, um, I, I guess, let's go here. Julie, what exactly is safe haven? And how does safe haven support and, and uniquely in our community? Safe Haven Ministries started out as Ramoth House, and so some people know us by that name more. We were started in 1990 by six area churches, and it was actually um, one of the church's social justice committee. They were just praying and thinking about and did some research for quite a while in Kent County, what is a, a need? And what they finally decided on was, we need more women's domestic abuse shelters. The government only provides funding for one shelter per county. So this was something that the churches started. Um, it was a smaller shelter to start with. In 2007, we moved into a larger home. It's a beautiful home, and it, we can have up to 11 women there and their children. In the year 2000, we changed our name to Safe Haven Ministries, and that's because we added what I do, which is um, speaking in the community, and also non-residential services, because not every victim needs to go or wants to go to the shelter. Um, I lead one of our education support groups, and the women in that group who are just coming to learn about the issue just run the gamut from just thinking about it, not even sure they're abused, to being in the process of, of trying to get away, to maybe having been gone for 10 years but are still having nightmares and still wanting to deal with this issue. So we offer you know, safety assessments and counseling and support groups, uh, legal advocacy. We have a program for children uh, to help them heal from the trauma and more than I can say in this interview. Sure, sure. So <clears throat> as, as we sit and uh, as we listen, <coughs> Maybe some of us have had experience. We, maybe we know people that have been in rough situations. Maybe we have heard about people in rough situations. And some of us are asking the question of, you know, how, how does this apply to me? Maybe some people are asking that question. Uh, and, and I think maybe uh, an entry level question in how does this relate to me is how do we see that? How do we recognize and how do I identify that? <clears throat> say like there's someone in the community that's experiencing a lot of grief H how do i put on eyes to even notice that mm -hmm. how do i identify abuse and what does that look like yeah um, i am a survivor and i did go through safe havens programs um, so what i want to how i want to answer this is to first talk about just abuse in general sort of what it is and there's a few more handouts back there i see but then also to, to, to answer specifically, yeah, what kind of signs can you look for in a victim and in an abuser? So abuse basically is about power and control and manipulation. It's about one person who's really not very secure, kind of like a playground bully who's grown up, who doesn't know how to relate in a healthy, equal way to their partner, and so they try to have power and control over their partner. Um, that can look a lot of different ways. So we talk about different types of abuse. Uh, there's spiritual abuse. So Christians, obviously, can be victims and assailants also. And in a way, they have more, um, more tactics, more tools in their tool belt that they can use because they can take the church's teachings or the sanctity of marriage or what the Bible says, and they can sort of take things out of context and use it in a manipulative way to get their spouse not to leave them or to do something. Um, spiritual abuse can also look like, you know, discouraging you from going to Bible study or to church or, or just disrespecting your beliefs in general. Physical abuse, anything that you can imagine, people do to each other, and it's really awful. Uh, people use weapons, guns, knives, any household object that's thrown at someone or, or someone is struck with can cause a lot of damage. Um, hitting, punching, kicking, slapping, hair pulling, um, the list goes on and on. It is also considered physical abuse even if you don't actually touch the person. But if you are blocking the uh, doorway to a room or a home, not letting that person leave, if you're parked behind them, refuse, refuse to move your car, if you drop them off in an unsafe neighborhood, say you're driving around, you have a fight, get out of the car, lock them out of the house. Those are all considered forms of physical abuse too. 
Um, sexual abuse is an area that a lot of times women don't see when they come to us. Sometimes it takes them a while to understand that this has been going on. It can be really subtle uh, emotional coercion or it can be using actual physical force for coercion to do things sexually that they don't want to do. Often pornography is used as a way to sort of normalize this. And emotional, verbal, psychological abuse. Women say that that is the most devastating because what that does is it really, it affects your soul, right? If our soul is our mind and our will and our emotions, um, it, it tears that down. It tears down the fabric of who that person is. Everything that attracted the assailant to the victim in the first place, her looks, her beauty, her whatever, her intelligence, um, skills that she has, he'll systematically try to tear those down and make her feel less than so she won't think that she can leave. So name calling, belittling, humiliating, um, the list goes on and on. And it can be very difficult to see a lot of women don't realize they're abused. So signs that you can see in a victim, maybe just a change in behavior. Maybe she used to come to church regularly or to Bible study and she's not coming so much. Um, and that's because a huge tactic is isolation on the part of the abuser. He doesn't want her to have support. So either directly or indirectly, he'll try to keep her from seeing her family and her friends and her support and her church. Other signs, this may sound unusual, but sometimes it's difficult to handle your children if you're in an abusive relationship because the children often want to side with the abuser because they see him as stronger and they don't want to be hurt by him. And the abuser will often undermine discipline, use the children as pawns, and it's very confusing uh, for them. There are many other things. As far as an abuser, signs to look for, the first thing you need to know is you may not see any signs. Because just like he was, I, and I say he because most abusers are men, but um, women can abuse also. So the way that the, the abuser was at the beginning of the relationship, he's, he's putting his good foot forward, right? He's wearing a mask. He's saying, I'm wonderful, I'm charismatic, I'm helpful, I'm friendly, I'm spiritual. And gradually he starts to test her boundaries. And so... Um, you might not see any signs because he knows how to do that. He knows how to function at his job. He doesn't treat his boss or his grandma or his neighbors the way he does his partner in the privacy of his home. That being said, um, they tend to be hypersensitive, overly insecure. They don't take criticism well. Again, think of a playground bully who's just gotten bigger, right? They don't have a strong sense of who they are. Um, they tend to push for quick involvement in the relationship. Any show of force is, is definitely a sign. Um, and, and again, there's many more, but I don't want to take too much time. Yeah, it really seems like a very uh, sort of systemic way to, to entrap. Uh, but yeah. even, even still, I think, I think there's this question <coughs> that exists out, out there that we're, we're all kind of wondering, you know, why can't she just leave? <laughs> it's like, you know, we don't want to really want to say it in those words and we don't want to like think oh just get out of that but why is it so <laughs> difficult why are they so trapped but we do think that and we do say that and i know better and i've heard myself say that to to people it's just a knee-jerk reaction what we think we know about abuse um and what we think we would do in that situation is totally different once you're in it because you're not the same person anymore <laughs> Your self-esteem has been so torn down and you've been told lies, basically, about who you are. And you need to claim the truth of who you are in Christ, but that's a, that's a process. So even just asking somebody that question, you know, why don't you leave? Makes them feel really misunderstood because it's very, very difficult to leave. Leaving is a process. And the thing about leaving is it is the most dangerous time in the relationship. On average, three women are murdered by their husband or partner a day in the United States. And of those women, 75% of them are murdered in the process of leaving. Because if somebody's trying to control another person, when they think they might lose that person, that's when things really get ratcheted up and can get very dangerous. 
So there are many, many reasons. Financial reasons are huge uh, for adults. If you don't think you have enough money to live on your own, if you haven't been working or not working full time, you don't know how you're going to buy your kids backpacks or send them to summer camp, um, that's a huge reason. Fear. Fear of what he might do. Fear of what you know the abuser is capable of. Threats have been made. Um, Oh gosh, again, there's just, there's so many reasons why it's hard to leave, um, but just understanding that is, is huge in, in helping the process. Yeah, it really seems like a, sort of a, a, a cycle of, of several things oh. all happening all at once. So <laughs> you, you prompted me, thank you. <laughs> you <learned>? I forget. <laughs> I forgot the biggest reason. And this, the reason I didn't say it right away is because this one takes a little explanation, so thank you for reminding me. The cycle of abuse is also a huge reason that keeps people stuck. So the cycle, just like with, say, a drug addict, they sort of go through a cycle, right? They use, and then they say, I'm never going to use again, right? And then, so like with the abuse, when they abuse, they say the same thing, I'm never going to do it again. And that's after that happens is what we call the honeymoon phase where he's really nice again and the victim doesn't want the relationship to end she just wants the abuse to end so she's really happy and she's thinking oh good everything's back to normal I'm not sure what the problem was but everything's fine now and I want to stay with this person but time goes by and just like a drug addict they start to feel off balance and tense because they need to use the abuser needs his fix of having power and control. It makes him feel more powerful. And there's many f reasons for that that I don't have time to go into. So he'll abuse. It could be just physical, just emotional, just spiritual, um, just sexual, or any combination. And so again, once he, once he abuses, he feels fine. And so if the police are called, often she's the one that gets arrested because he's calm, he looks very credible, she's a mess, she doesn't know how to talk about it, she may not even know that she's being abused, um, so it gets really tricky. So that hope for change is what keeps her stuck. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So we're getting, I think, sort of really into the mind of someone who is abusing. We're, we're literally crawling around and we're discovering like the why, you know, like mm -hmm. the power paradigm um, and the control that they seek. Uh, he, here's something that I think we, we all might be wondering, what about the abusers? What about those who are abusing? How do we, I mean, it's so hard to see that. It, 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 even if we do see that, what, what is there that we can potentially do? Is there a, a, a way to intervene? How does that work? That's a very good question. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is the importance of confidentiality. We might want to be a knight in shining armor, and if we see this is going on, or if we're told this is going on, we might want to go to him and say, hey, bud, you know, this isn't okay. This is not what you should be doing. You need to cut it out. But that can be very dangerous for the victim. It really needs to be her choice when or if the abuser is ever confronted. So that's really, really important because he doesn't want other people to know, right? And he might think that she's trying to get help and she's telling other people. I think it can be appropriate if you see the abuse yourself in a public place to maybe take the abuser aside at another time and just make it clear, hey, I saw what you did or I heard what you said, but make no reference to the victim at all. Um, some ways that a, a church can help an abuser is to actually give him some financial support to get help. Treatment and shelter and counseling for victims is usually free or very, very nominal. Uh, we get less than 1% of our, of our you know, budget from victims. That's, that's not where we're looking for it. But for abusers, for them to go through the six-month program either at the YWCA or at Fountain Hill Center, they both have six-month group programs, it costs on a sliding scale between $600 and $1,500. And that can really be a barrier. Even if they you know, come out at the $600 level, they might say, well, I'm not spending that. And most people who end up in those groups are there because they're court ordered. 
very few people will just sort of be there on their own. So that could remove one barrier for them. Um, speaking of court ordered, that's another thing, to allow the legal process to do what it needs to do. And sometimes the victim doesn't want to call 911. Um, sometimes it's a process for her. But if somebody's life is in danger, you need to call 911. And most abusers don't change unless they are arrested, unless they really are faced with losing something, just like an addict of other types. Um, it's very difficult to change once people are adults. Let me just look at this to make sure I'm not. You know, you can approach him. You can express concern if it's sort of made public what's going on. You can pray with him. You can challenge him if he's using some sort of spiritual abuse, if he's using issues of headship and submission and suffering um, to his advantage. And, you know, to name the, the problem of violence as, as his, um, not hers. You can't fix this by couples counseling. Um, she needs to get strong on her own and he needs to get help on his own. A real dichotomy between how they get help. Very, yes. very separate ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we're, we're heading toward a close here. Uh, we, we would love to hear more. We, I think we've, it's been sort of interspersed within, within our conversation today. But as far as us as a community, what are more ways that we can support uh, not only safe haven, but individuals that we see. I mean, each of us has sort of our own little circle of influence, people that we know, maybe at work, you know, maybe in a, in a group that we're a part of. In, in various places, we, we know many, many people amongst all of us. What, what are more ways that we can sort of network, uh, be more attentive to others, more observant? How, how can we continue to do that? More practical stuff. Yeah, that's a great question. What I want to say to you, first of all, is you already are and have been doing a ton. Even when I hear you talk about, you know, partnering with Safe Haven, I mean, that's, that's our goal, to partner with churches. Because how a faith community responds to a victim is really just as important as the work that we do at Safe Haven. I can't tell you how many women are in the support group and they have left their church because there was not understanding there. Um, they did not feel supported. In fact, maybe they were threatened with being excommunicated or, or kicked out or disciplined or something. So that's really painful if you add that on top when the church can be such a supportive place. So you have been very proactive. You have given, you've, I know that you've donated um, wish list items. You're raising awareness. I know that you have volunteered. And you kind of have just, you've done this under the radar. I, we were, I was sort of told about what was going on like a year after you started your involvement. And um, so obviously you're not out to get glory for yourself. But those are amazing ways. Um, you can further education. You know, I present to youth groups. I have volunteers that do. Um, it's so important for youth to hear this message. We consider that prevention. Until our brains are hardwired at around age 25, it's much easier to take in new information and say, oh, I didn't know that. I don't want to treat my spouse that way or my dating partner that way. Um, and to change. Let me just make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, as far as supporting the woman, Tangible support is huge. Again, I talked about how income may be lowered. Um, we always, I think reconciliation is the goal, but it doesn't often occur. But it's really recommended by professionals that they be apart for at least 18 months to two years while they work on their own issues, and then if possible, to come together. So during that time, you know, it's kind of like the widows and orphans that need support, right? I'm not saying all women don't know how to fix toilets or cars, but I didn't, and I needed help. Sometimes they need financial help, just a bag of groceries. Um, taking them out for lunch, continuing to just ask them how they are, um, to believe them when they talk about this uh, with you, to support them. If they're not ready to get help, maybe asking them some, some questions or saying things like, you know, this isn't your fault because blame is just a huge part of abuse, and the victim internalizes that and thinks it's her fault. 
So why would she leave, right? She just needs to fix this and make it right, um, letting her know that you're concerned for her safety, that her children are affected, because children are, whether they're directly abused or not, they are affected very negatively by abuse in the home. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. We do have time for a few questions. So anything, I mean, we, we don't even expect to have covered even like hardly a no. fraction <laughs> of what's out there. But if there are any questions, we'd love to continue kind of the conversation. And if no one has questions, that's OK, because I have a couple more. Um, but I, love, I love some questions from, from here, some fresh voices. And we've got a microphone coming around if you, you've got one. So let us know if you have got a question. As you're thinking. Uh, <laughs> Julie, um, you, you talked a little bit about um, young people and sort of mm -hmm. raising awareness at as young of an age as possible. Uh, yes. how, how do you do that? I mean, it, it seems like a tough thing. I mean, at the age of six, do you just, you know, how, how often is it, you know, should this come up maybe in the home? Uh, how, how can we sort of like uh, weave this into our lives in a positive way, you know? Mm -hmm. How can re re we uh, reinforce the right behaviors but at the same time sort of bar going past uh, boundaries. How do, how do we do that in the home? That's, that's a real, but. yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the same answer is true for the home as well as for a church community, right? The leadership, how leadership in a home or in a church communicates. Is there equality there? Is there, I mean, obviously there has to be a leadership hierarchy, but how is that leadership um, handled? Do you take advantage of that? Do you lord it over the other person? Is there healthy communication? Is there equality? Um, and when that's modeled in the home, I mean children, the, the relationship of their parents is just kind of like this safety umbrella over them. And if they're raised in a home where that love of Ephesians 5 is really shown, where it's a servant leadership, where they want to submit to each other and work things out. Um, I think it makes children feel safe and to learn how to handle conflict, um, not to shy away from it. I think sometimes people don't know, especially young people when they're first in a relationship, they don't really know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And so they just sort of accept what are, oh, this is what a dating relationship is like, even if they grew up in a healthy home. Um, so to learn how to deal with conflict, that's a really good way for a young person to sort of ascertain what is this person I'm dating all about? Can they, can they deal with this? And it's so hard because a lot of people are in the situation where they grew up with a great example. Other people yes. are in a situation where they didn't grow up with an awesome example from yep. mom and dad or mom or dad. And, and you're, you're caught between these two worlds. Yeah. Um, do we have... Oh, we have a few brave souls. Oh, great. Okay. Three great. brave souls. <laughs> I guess uh, my heart's beating really fast. Um, not so much uh, a question, but uh, I guess just a big thank you. I wish, uh, mm. I wish this would have been around from when I was younger because uh, my, dad, my, my dad was really abusive to my mom, mm. and uh, I grew up with that. I mean, it was with my brother and sisters and us hiding because how physical abusive my dad mm -hmm. was to uh, <clears throat> Us, us kids and my mom. So I, I wish she would have had someone to go to. Um, so I just thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, much appreciated. It's something that is everywhere. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Um, you touched on what you can do once the woman is out of the relationship. Oh, there you are. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, but what, what if they're in the relationship still, what steps can you take to help the woman gain the courage to do what yeah. she needs to do and to get out? It, it really is a process, and a lot of times friends and family become frustrated, and sometimes we'll even 
threaten to or follow through with saying, I can't see you anymore until you leave this person. It's too disturbing to me. But that isolates the person even more. Um, I think just letting them know that you're there when they're ready to talk about it. Um, there's a lot of shame that goes with this. Um, it would be like you telling your deepest, darkest secret of something that you've done or something someone's done to you. This is not something people want to talk about. Hey, I'm abused. They, they think everybody else's home is happy and theirs is the problem and they can't figure it out. So they just need ongoing support and prayer, um, challenging them with some questions, you know, how do you think this is, how is this like for your, for your children? Do you want them to grow up to, you know, sort of follow this example? Um, not that everybody does. Um, the tangible support, but again, and, and referral, okay, that's, that's huge. So you've learned to recognize the signs of this, how to respond to it a little bit, but referral is the biggest part of that response. You don't have to be the expert. Nobody in this church does. You don't have to figure out, he said, she said, is it abuse, is it not? Don't worry about that. Refer them to the YWCA or Safe Haven and um, let the experts sort of make those determinations and they can get their help there, but you can continue to support them. Just knowing that there are people behind them when, when they are ready, sometimes it's just a trigger. They see something with the children, it's like, that's it. You know what, you can mess with me, but do not mess with my kids. And that'll finally be the last straw. You never know when it is. And then they'll know to come to you. And also to let them know how important um, safety planning is in leaving. They can go online, they can contact us, there's lots of resources. But the more you plan for leaving, the safer it is. So that's huge. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for just one more. So I don't, I don't know who is, but let's do one more. Um, and also, as in, the, in between, Julie is available too um, at any point. Email, I think oh. you even said phone. You, yeah, you can drop absolutely. her email, stop by the office near center point. Yes, absolutely. Because, yeah. you know, just like you so bravely talked, whenever we, you talk about this issue, if one in four, really closer to one in three women are in an abusive relationship in their lifetime, and many people are abused as children, um, this is going to hit home for a lot of you. So call us. You can call us 24-7. You can talk to me. You can talk to somebody else. Help is available. Anytime. Yeah. Well, I know you kind of said something about how um, most of the abusers are men, but do you feel like there has been more of an awareness of women being abusive? Or what do you do in those circumstances? Um, because I, that's a completely different you know, thing. Like guys don't really like to come forward or admit that you know, they were being abused because they want to be a tough guy. Like my, um, my husband now, he was in an abusive relationship mm -hmm. and she still <clears throat> continually tries to control, manipulate and abuse and we get so frustrated sure. and it, it's so hard to deal with. Yeah, that's a really good question. My heart really goes out to male victims of, of abuse in our culture. I think there may be a couple shelters for men nationwide. Um, I think just because of the way our society is, men are supposed to be tough, which really isn't fair. It kind of puts them in a box. Um, and women are supposed to be subservient or whatever. Um, it makes it hard for them to come forward and say, hey, someone is, is hurting me because they're supposed to be the tough one. Um, that being said, it gets really tricky because unfortunately, abusers love to play the victim role and there are tons of websites out there run by abusers who are claiming to be victims. And so it's like the story of the little boy who cried wolf, right? So many men are claiming to be victims when they're not. It's almost like a classic sign of abuse that how do you know when someone really is? So my heart goes out to them. Um, and we, have, uh, we can meet with someone or talk with someone. The other part of that is sometimes women get very frustrated over the years. Nothing works. I can't get through to them. And they might start responding with physical or emotional abuse back, thinking maybe this will get his attention. Maybe he'll see how it feels. But her motive is different. And even if there's 
and I don't know that it happens much, I'm still researching this, but even if there's abuse that goes both ways, women are physically less strong. Most men can actually strangle their partner, but most women can't. We just don't have as much muscle mass um, or height usually. And financially, men usually have a lot more resources. Um, but absolutely, men can be abused, women can be abusive. It is not just men abusing women. Well, talk this, a long time. <laughs> hey, this conversation continues. Um, it can continue uh, amongst us. Uh, any specific questions for Julie can, mm -hmm. of course, uh, head her way via email. Um, we will be making that available. Um, so as I said, thank you for the questions and for mm -hmm. honesty. Much, much appreciated. And again, that continues. Uh, okay. as, we, as we transition, uh, I'd like to invite the band up. And I am, I'm going to lead a prayer for, for Safe Haven as we uh, head toward our offering in a moment here. <clears throat> 